Hi everybody, Dr. Britt Talley Daniel, MD. I'm a neurologist and a headache doctor. I've written the only American book on transient global amnesia in about 25 years, which is on Amazon as a print book and as an ebook. And if you go to Amazon.com and you enter my name in there, Britt Talley Daniel, T A L L E Y Daniel. You can see all my books and you can order it there if you wish. Now I've got two previous YouTube videos up on transit global amnesia and I'm getting a lot of reader interest there so I'm going to do another talk on transit global amnesia and the subject of this talk is going to be the difference between primary or real transit global amnesia and secondary transit global amnesia. So even though the events that um, make up the kind of amnesia loss syndrome attacks were first noted in France. Um, they were not recognized in the United States till Morris Bender at, um, in, in New York wrote an article about this in 1956. And then um, another article was written in um, 19. 82, which was the primary article on this by Fisher and Bender, and they were the main writers of it, and they were the ones who named this syndrome, trans and global amnesia. Now, Dr. Lewis Kaplan has been the protagonist as a university professor and writer and great clinical uh, neurologist who's written most of the articles on defining trans and global amnesia. And he was kind enough to endorse my book. So, in 1985, he gave an excellent thorough review of transit global amnesia in what's called the Handbook of Clinical Neurology, which is a multi-bottom and multiple vo volume um, book of neurology published years ago. And one of his sterling contributions to understanding TGA was his analysis of patient population attacks from prior reports. And he stated that in the ideal situation, in the next, he's going to define, and I'll read it to you, the criteria that make up what transit global amnesia really is. Number one, information about the beginning of the attack should be available from a capable observer who witnessed the onset. Thus, he excluded patients whose attacks were unwitnessed or came in because of head trauma or loss of consciousness, which is not part of the syndrome. Number two, the patient had, should have been examined during the attack to be certain that other neurologic symptoms and signs did not accompany the amnesia. Ideally, the examination would have been performed by neurologists, but since this is impractical, information from, quote, a careful, concerned witness, quote, was observed, who observed and interacted with the patient would be acceptable. And he thought that unacceptable reports solely from the patient for more casual companions are really not worthy of understanding. In fact, the literature thought he had always said that he had to be evaluated by a neurologist, but later he made another statement about that, saying, no, he just needed someone who had, even a lay person could examine the patient and make decisions. Number three, there should be no important accompanying neurologic signs. Symptoms or signs of neurologic dysfunction other than memory related that developed during an attack are clearly grounds for exclusion, especially if they lead to a permanent deficit. So like somebody who starts with trouble with memory loss, and it exists the rest of their life. Well, that's like a thalamic stroke, but it's not transient global amnesia. The word transit means temporary, it goes away. That's the next point. Four, the memory loss should be transient, but it was, because the article's been published, it wasn't clear how long it should be originally. Although the time is now set to be less than 24 hours, and usually they last six to eight hours. And he admitted that transit global amnesia had no definitive confirmatory laboratory investigations. And what he calls such a cute way of writing, I think, fuzzy boundaries. That's great. But his analysis provided later writers with a firm structure for defining the syndrome. Now, um, one of the problems with transit global amnesia now in the world is the true cause is not really exactly known, although one of the most enduring concepts has been that it relates to migraine. Many of the patients have migraine with transit global amnesia. Many patients will have their 
complex migraine visual event, like a migraine aura, like a, like a migraine with aura has, seeing zigzag lines, or at the same time they have memory loss, so there's a conjunction of a migraine event along with amnesia in, in many patients. And one of the big shots in the headache world is Dr. Olson and writing with Jorgensen in 1986 in Acta Neurologica Scandinavia, he said, he thought Leo's spreading depression hippocampus explains transient global amnesia. But the TGA is really of unknown etiology. So, what is spreading depression? Well, that comes from uh, a writer um, back in the 40s who was uh, working on a rabbit and he dropped some acid on the brain at the time he had EEG electrodes stuck in the rabbit's brain. And you can see cessation of electrical activity all across the brain that happened slowly and subsequently right after that. So it was a spreading wave of inactivity. I'll show you a picture out of my book on transit and amnesia. It makes a point about what it looks like to some degree. Get this straight for you. Whoa. So it's kind of like you throw a rock in water and it spreads out from the back of the occipital part of the brain, the back of the brain, these little red lines go forward and kind of knock out that part of the brain function. When I've educated, talked to residents or uh, patients or neurology students about this, I've always said it's kind of like the movie E.T. where they're standing up on top of a hill in Los Angeles and they see all the lights of the city spread out before them, but then the lights slowly go out one sector to the next and just kind of spread across the city, and you can see it from the top of the hill in the movie. So that's kind of what happens with brain dysfunction. It spreads across the brain, and if it gets to the temporal lobes, the hippocampus, it can knock out that part of the function and cause amnesia. Okay. Also, what's happened is a development in the intervening time between Morris, ben Morris Bender's off article, I'm sorry, in 1956 and nowadays was there was found that there was a condition called um, temporal epileptic amnesia. So there's a type of transient epileptic amnesia, TEA, which affects from seizure discharge causes amnesia. And this was part of the early history of the syndrome. Early writers like Fisher and Adams thought that transit global amnesia itself was related to epilepsy. And a lot of, most of the EEGs that were done in patients with transient global amnesia were normal. And some of them had some slow wave dysfunction. Some of them had what were later thought to be a benign kind of pattern of uh, sharp waves that wouldn't be anything serious. Um, and so there is a syndrome now of transient epileptic amnesia. These are folks that have um, shorter seizures. They may last five or 10 minutes. Um, many times they can be controlled by uh, the use of anticonvulsants, and they should have an abnormal EEG. And that's a completely separate, different thing from transient global amnesia. Transit-global amnesia has been found to have these little dots in the hippocampus that are seen on MRI scans. And I'm going to show you some pictures of this from my textbook. You can see the arrows and the dots, and these are deep inside the hippocampus. An MRI scan is a very technical thing, but uh, one of the sequences they run when they do the test is to do what's called a diffusion weighting image of DWI. And that sequence, about two days after a TGA event, will show these little dots and they appear. And then they go, on, go away after a week or several days and they don't show up anymore. So it's this temporary production of these little dots that we see in the hippocampus and memory is stored in the hippocampus. That's where TJ is occurring. And so that was the hot information that got everybody so 
fired up about transit global and amnesia in the last four or five years. Now, so transit global amnesia is an event that may relate to migraine, may relate to transit uh, spreading depression. There are other um, causes that have been proposed, but no one really at this time knows exactly what it is. So I'm going to now talk about the, sim the secondary forms of transit global amnesia. Now, these don't relate to that kind of event. And so different chemicals can do this. It's well known that patients who drink alcohol can have an alcoholic blockout for amnesia, but that's not transit global amnesia, although articles have been written about alcohol causing transit global amnesia. The use of benzodiazepine drugs has been reported as causing amnesia, like lorazepam, halcyon, and versed. All right. Hang on, I got to find my page here. Well, there are a bunch of uh, different, several vascular diseases that have been related to TGA. People write an article saying, TGA and temporal hemorrhage. The hemorrhage is a bleed in the brain. Well, that's a stroke. It's an abnormal uh, MRI scan and may have a long life, long events of, of uh, no recovery. So this is not TGA. And so there have been articles written on temporal hemorrhage, on subarachnoid hemorrhage with arterial spasm. There have been acute thalamic infarction, uh, which is the thalamus is part of where memory is stored. You've had they've had transit memory events related to common carotid artery occlusion, related to ischemic infarcts in the left temporal lobe, to uh, infarction in the corpus callosum, which is a connecting part of the neural tissue between the right and left hemisphere, and acute cingulate gyrus hemorrhage. There have been a lot of articles. In fact, one of the first articles on transglobal amnesia in the literature was one related to angiography. And so they've thought it's related to embolism, microemboli, to seizures, to spasm, to toxic effect of contrast agents, to ionic contrast agent. Is it one of these drugs that's given? Contrast agent means they inject this thing in your arteries and it shows up on an arteriogram so you can see the difference between the brain and the artery. So one of the chemicals was the iopamidol. There are articles written on ischemic etiology of angiography and TGA. Uh, arterial spasm again, cerebral angiograms, so a bunch of articles in that regard. Then there have also been articles written on brain tumors and transient global amnesia. Well, of course, brain tumor is something pathologically abnormal. It shows up on the scan. And many of these patients have had surgery. They died from the problem. So the report was given in 1974 on surgically removed pituitary tumor causing transient global amnesia. Unoperated thalamic tumor, which is likely a glomo, which actually killed a patient, causing transit global amnesia since 1977. Another patient had an unoperated glioblastoma multiforma. There was bronchryptine treated hemorrhagic pituitary tumor. There was radiation and chemotherapy treated metastatic left temporal tumor. Or surgically operated giant transcentorial meningioma. These are all organic neurologic brain problems and they're significant, they do involve memory, but they're not the primary symptom of transit global amnesia as defined by Dr. Bender, Fisher, and Adams, and mentioned by Dr. Kaplan. They've also had these related to, reports have, been, have come out related to the use of marijuana, to halogenated hydroquinoline, to PD inhibitors. Those are the drugs men take for um, erection difficulty. Dr. Kaplan article, wrote one of those articles. The Viagra, the drug was given, sildenafil, caused uh, temporary memory loss. Articles written on digitalis intoxication, the use of scopolamine. Several articles on ergotamine, which is a vasoconstrictor, it helps migraines, a drug for treating migraines, and when related to uh, memory loss. Cases related to DMS, MSO infusion, to statin to heparin perfusion. All right, so all these reports have been given in the neurology literature. And 
And I'm reading from chapter 8 of my textbook on page 207. This is so cute. Listen to Dr. Kaplan. He wrote this article in Neurology um, in uh, 1986 in response to an article. Uh, so Dr. Kaplan said, when I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. So what Kaplan's point is, if I see transient global amnesia, I mean this benign syndrome that has normal tests except for occasionally we'll have it two days, the diffusion-weighted image, little dots in the brain, but EEG is normal, all other tests are basically normal, long range, and the patient clears up usually in six to eight hours and does well, and it's a benign kind of syndrome. So he talks about that and how that's helpful for neurology to sort those things out. All right, so I'm going to conclude at this point a short review of the history of different writers who've talked about medical and neurologic conditions that have transient or sometimes long-range memory loss or confused with transient global amnesia. And there's been a plea for editors of neurology art journals to specifically use transient global amnesia for the primary syndrome, as well known in the literature I've quoted to you. So, I hope this helps you clear this up a little bit between the two types of things, problems. Um, best wishes to anyone who's had transient global amnesia. Usually it's benign syndrome, as Dr. Fisher said. Usually, it, I'm sorry, Dr. Bender said it rarely repeats, so there are articles showing it repeats a couple of times. It is not related to brain tumors or anything serious wrong in the brain or a stroke, and the patient usually does well. So, God bless you. Thanks for watching.